Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. The service will begin shortly. Please take your seats, silence all electronic devices, and refrain from all flash photography during the program. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the United States Air Force Color Guard, our national anthem, and the invocation given by Father Conroy. What so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming. 
whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, the work of your hands is made known in your bountiful creation and in the lives of those who faithfully live in your grace. Today, we especially remember the life and work of Louise Slaughter, daughter of Kentucky, but fierce representative of the 25th District of New York for more than 30 years. Her impact on the public wheel beyond her own district far exceeded any projection of ego strength. May we all be inspired by her example to be men and women impelled to improve the lives and prospects of our fellow citizens while eschewing any honor or glory for ourselves as she did. Do our part to increase understanding and respect across the many divides that characterize our national DNA. Be present with us this day, O oh God, as we mark her life and remember her legacy. Bless this gathering and comfort us as we comfort one another in remembering a great American and a genuinely good woman. Amen. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Tonko and represent the 20th Congressional District of New York, but most importantly, I bear the label of longtime buddy of Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. Thank you all for being here to honor and remember a great friend and extraordinary human being, Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. I had the good fortune of meeting Louise in the early 1980s when we entered as freshmen into the New York State Assembly. As I think back on our friendship and her decades of service, I am reminded of her strength, her bright-eyed laughter, the sweet Kentucky honey in her voice, and that fierce glamour she delivered each and every day, oftentimes showcased as the storyteller she is. And wow, no matter how small or large the audience, she loved to entertain with her storytelling. And I and we miss her terribly. Louise was a visionary in the truest sense. She lifted the cause of women's rights, of racial, social, and environmental justice onto her mighty shoulders and carried them across decades. As the only microbiologist in Congress, she fought to protect us from genetic discrimination, from antibiotic-resistant diseases, and from the threat of corruption and greed in the People's House. And she helped open the door to affordable health care for millions of Americans. Louise was mighty for us. She made the rules. She bent the arc of history toward justice. Her achievements in life were historic, a legacy of service that will continue to lift each and every one of us 
for generations to come. Her life will impact generations unborn. Louise loved much and was much loved. To all who were lucky enough to know and claim her, her friends, her colleagues, her office and committee staff, and yes, indeed, most importantly, her family, Louise's friendship was a gift, a blessing. Let our grief at her absence be part of that blessing. Let us be animated by our memories of her that our backbones might be more steel, our eyes more bright, and our stories more human. Today I rise for you, Louise. Thank you for your light and your gift of your life. Rest in peace, my friend. You will never be forgotten. Praise God for the life of Louise Slaughter. My name is Gwendolyn Moore. I'm a member from Wisconsin's 4th Congressional District from Milwaukee, the Milky Way. Uh, let me uh, just tell you that this, is, um, this experience of transitioning and having your friends and loved ones transitioning is something that we all uh, must face and all must endure. Uh, but you know, and I just recently, just last week, buried my sister, who I call Mama Sister, because she was like my second mother. And I uh, just want to tell you a little funny story. I was over at her house with some cousins and with my little granddaughter, and my other sister was saying, well, Gwen, do you, do you want her fur coat? Do you want her, her grandfather clock? Do you? I said, no, 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 all I want are those boxes of LPs she has in the basement. And my granddaughter, who's 14, said, Grandma, what are LPs? Well, Louise was an LP. She was a long playing record. <laughs> Louise lived 88 years, people. And had she not worked in this insane environment, it's hard to believe that she wouldn't have hit 100 at least. And I mean, she had energy like no one else. I traveled with Louise uh, on the Helsinki Commission, traveled up with her to Rochester, uh, her and Bob, and I mean, I was just like family with them. And I will miss her for that. I remember the first time my baby sister Brenda saw Louise on TV. And I walked into the, my apartment here on the hill, and she said, who, who, who is that? Who is that old lady? <laughs> you know, what was her name? And finally, when we determined that it was Louise Slaughter, she said, that old lady was kicking that behind today. <laughs> she was sure enough bringing it to them. She was one long playing act. I mean, brilliant, not one ounce of uh, dementia. She was quick-witted. You sit in that rules committee and she could snap right. I know the Republicans can attest to that. <laughs> that she didn't miss a beat. She's an LP because she had lots of personality. I mean, the thing that tickled me so much was the Bob story. I mean, I'm always fascinated. As a person who doesn't have a husband, nobody has ever wanted to marry me. I'm always interested in hearing the stories. Paul, you promised to find me a husband. You didn't do it. <laughs> Another broken promise of the Republicans. <laughs> um, when she, I said, well, well, you know, Louise, how did you, how did you get with Bob and stay with Bob and so on? She said, girl, when I saw him, I said, I have got to have him. So here's somebody who's 88 years old and still uh, loved her husband, and, and he loved her, and they are there together, and I am happy for them to have rejoined each other. I mean, this woman had swagger. She had style, and she used to see me all the time fawning over anybody and anything that was orange. I love the color orange. Only reason I'm not wearing it today is because I'm scared of Frederica Wilson. 
Frederica say on Wednesday you have to wear red. And you'll see a whole lot of people today wearing red because Frederica, but I love orange. And Louise went out and bought me an orange purse because I love orange so much. And she uh, is a person that had the kind of swagger and just was friendly and loving and did that. Oh, I'm telling you, Louise had a lot of power. She's a LP. I mean, on that rules committee, I mean, that was that is the committee that sets the agenda for Congress. I don't know how she did it. That light would be on two, three o'clock in the morning, you know. And I mean, how how do you do that? She she went through all kinds of ailments, broken femur, you know, and she still wielded power. But what I loved about her is that she wielded it for the little people. You've heard the special orders and tributes that have been made to her, and she always cared about the people who had no health care, the people who didn't own stocks, the people who would be victimized by too many, uh, uh, too many things in foods uh, that were not healthy for them, antibiotics and such. She was fervent about protecting little people. And she was a lover of people. She loved people. She was so friendly. She was one of the most approachable members around here. And I have, I have, uh, I've benefited from that tremendously. She was somebody who loved people. You know, she told me once, she shared something with me once about uh, Bob. She said that when she first brought Bob home to meet her parents and her dad made his initial assessment of Bob, she said, oh, he just cares too much for the common man. And Louise was a lover of people and she cared about the common man. And finally, as I hurried to a close, as they say in the Baptist church, Louise was the life of the party. I'm telling you, we would get down to the Democratic Club and she would hold court. She'd walk in and I would say, all rise, <laughs> Louise is arriving. And I will miss her so much, but I am 67 years old today. And one of the things that I've learned in this life is that people never really leave you if you don't forget them. And if you don't forget the things that they taught you and shared with you, you know, you will never be left behind. God bless you all. God bless the family of Louise Slaughter, and we will never, ever forget her. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gwen. It was really wonderful. And you you really got a flavor of Louise from Gwen. You know, Louise Slaughter was my friend. I loved <laughs> Louise. And I think many of you share that also. And the one thing I always knew about Louise, she always had my back. She always had my back. And what struck me when we went to Rochester for the services were the many people with Louise buttons that lined the streets. I knew then that she had their backs too. She made each person feel so special. Maybe it was her southern twang that pulled you in or the sparkle in her eyes or just the fact that being around Louise was such fun. I first met Louise when I joined the House Rules Committee. I was new to Congress. I'd just been elected. Now, I barely understood the rules of the House, and here I was assigned to the Rules Committee. And dear Louise, she said, honey, do not worry. We got it. Louise took me under her wing. 
taught me not only the rules of the house, but the rules of Louise. <laughs> be cordial, be kind, know your stuff. Understand it is a privilege to serve in the House of Representatives. Always stay true to your word and fight for what you believe is right. And probably most importantly, laugh. Laugh, laugh with your friends, which she and I did a lot. We spent many memorable days and nights together when we're, I was on the Rules Committee. It was amazing. Sometimes it was 24 hours. You learn a lot about each other then, especially when we were on the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And the lovely thing is, is that her love, of, her love of the life, her life, Bob, her husband, was there too, sitting in the Rules Committee. She was practically an honorary member of the Rules Committee. It was so wonderful to see them together, lock eyes. It was wonderful. And Louise's leadership kept everyone around her going through those late nights. And her wit helped ease the tense days. You know, Louise traced her lineage back to Daniel Boone. Now you can kind of see the frontier person in her. She was a pioneer herself, the daughter of a Kentucky blacksmith. She went on to fight for the people of Western New York and was the first woman, as we know, to serve as chair of the powerful House Rules Committee. And not far from Louise's district is the site of the historic Seneca Falls Convention. Louise drew from that history and spent her career championing the causes of women everywhere. As Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, the best protector any woman can have is courage. Louise's courage to fight for her progressive ideals, to stand up for equality, to ensure working families have every opportunity to succeed, was a model for everyone, and particularly young girls everywhere, and really a model for all of us in Congress. And as one of her favorite poets, Maya Angelou said, each time a woman stands up for herself, she stands up for all women. That's what Louise did. And as she stood up for other women, she always stayed true to who she was. She was genuine. She was a real deal. She loved people. And she was so kind. Her passion for the arts bridged all of her life experiences. It really came from her family. As a unit, they sang together. And this kept on throughout her life. She loved everything, all kinds of music, from the 50s to 60s, gospel music, even hard rock, classical music, country music, everything. There is a sense of communication with Louise. She understood that music tied people together, brought people together, brought people to understand each other. And it was that authenticity and approachability also paired with her pioneering spirit that made her both so tenacious and so well loved. She loved everyone. She went up to everyone, whether it was in a grocery store, whether it was visitors here, not even her constituents. She went up to them and asked them questions. She saw a child and she went down to their level and started talking to them. That's Louise. It is with sadness now when I go up to the Rules Committee. I do feel her presence and her strong opinions. But you know what? I know she's happy. She's now reunited with her dear husband, Bob, and chairing the Rules Committee from a pie. Louise still rules. Thank you.
We are all FOLs, friends of Louise. I'm Rosa DeLauro, and I represent the third district of Connecticut. You know, we, uh, we all still look for her on the floor. <laughs> we do. Often the aisle seat there she was, because she would hold court in those, on that aisle seat. I remember one of my first memories and my last memory with Louise. Before I came to Congress, I traveled with her to Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Costa Rica as part of Countdown 87, the campaign to end military funding to the Nicaragua Contras. We won that fight, and we cut off military aid. And while we were in Nicaragua, we met clandestinely in the middle of the night with the rebels. On our way to a meeting the next day, we were waiting for an elevator. It was endless. It was endless. But then someone explained to us that it, the elevator was overworked because it was the only elevator in Nicaragua. We looked at one another and we said, we went to war with a country with only one elevator? <laughs> How could this be? My last member, we bought some wonderful sombreros which we took home. <laughs> My last memory was the evening before Louise passed, visiting her in the hospital with Anna Escher. We were blessed to be able to see her one last time. From the first to the last, to my run for Congress in 1990, when she came to Connecticut to campaign for me. And in all the years since, it was my honor and privilege to fight side by side with Louise Slaughter. Over her 30-year career, Louise fought for peace. She fought for women. She fought for health care. She fought for women's health. She fought for food safety. She fought for workers. She fought to end a war. She was fearless and peerless with a passion and a persistence that would make her dad, a coal mine blacksmith, proud. She never took no for an answer. She never backed away from a fight. And with that warm smile, a sharp wit, an impish gleam in her eye, and that southern drawl, Louise could rip your heart out. <laughs> she never gave up. You know, you all know the saying that during that campaign, which was a tough one when she broke her leg, and she just said, and I quote, now I will just have a leg up. <laughs> her legislative achievements spanning a huge breadth of progressive policies, including becoming the first woman to chair the powerful House Rules Committee since its creation in 1789 reflect that tireless commitment. She built a formidable legacy in her fight for women's health. She sponsored the first law directing the National Institutes of Health to research DES, diethyl stilbestrol, a drug that was given to pregnant women in the United States that was found to cause serious birth defects. And before she led the effort with a, a number of us to make sure that the NIH included women in their clinical trials. NIH research was conducted on men only, even for cervical cancer, can you imagine? She was a passionate advocate for health. A microbiologist, she brought an expert's eye to science policy, authoring a law protecting people's genetic information. And Ted Kennedy called it, and I quote, the first civil rights legislation of the 21st century. And she was the heartbeat of the American worker. I will always remember our fight against the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And when the Fast Track Bill came to the floor, in 2015, Louise and I were a team. We ran the war room from her Capitol Hill office not very far from here. 
And she said to me, I'll bring the bagels and the cream cheese, you bring the lists. And when she walked into her office, which was crammed with members and with staff on the phones, making phone calls, and she looked at us and she said, and I quote, you all look smarter than a tree full of owls. <laughs> Most recently, we sat side by side in my office every week in the trade meetings. We we're talking about the NAFTA renegotiations. She sat on my living room couch in all those public policy dinners week after week. And she said to me, can I bring Bob along? And I said, Louise, Bob can come without you. <laughs> she sat in the same place, and we're going to put a plaque on that, Mr. Tonko, which said, this is Louise Slaughter's chair in this house. Louise loved serving in the Congress. She loved her husband, Bob, and her daughters, Megan and Amy and Robin. She was lovely. You know, my mom's name was Louisa. And when she lived with Stan and I later in her life, I began to call my mother Lou Babe. And Louise and I got so close that I called her with the same term of endearment, Lou Babe. My mom and my sister, I love them both. I will close on this. Louise was a path breaker. Today, we are proud to tell our daughters and our granddaughters that women can do anything. And today, people say, of course, of course, women can go to college. Of course, women can go to graduate school. Of course, women can be microbiologists. Of course, women can be torch singers. And of course, women can be members and leaders of the United States Congress, of course. Louise did every one of those. And by achieving all that she did, she blazed a trail for all women so that they could follow her lead. But most of all, they could follow their dreams. She fought for her values. She fought for women, for working families. And in so doing, she helped pull this nation closer to its ideal closer to what she knew it could be. She made it a nation where, of course, women would leave a lasting legacy in the Congress because, of course, Louise did. I love you, my friend, and I miss you, Lou Babe. Saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear relieved our precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many days Toils and snares We 
have already come Twas grace that brought us safe thus far And grace will lead us home Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see was blind but now I see Good afternoon. Uh, Speaker uh, Leader Pelosi has graciously allowed me to get ahead of her in the line because we have a vote in the Senate. So thank you, Nancy, for that and everything else. Now, it's a privilege here to speak about my dear friend, our colleague, Louise Slaughter. I used to call her not Louise, but as her family knows and Rochesterians know, Wheezy, out of great love and affection. I see her three wonderful daughters, Megan, Amy, Robin, Louise's seven grandchildren, great-grandson, who are the light of her life. What a legacy. Now, Wheezy may have been born in Kentucky, but she was a New Yorker through and through. She never backed down from a challenge, never backed away from a fight, and certainly, as we all know, was never afraid to speak her mind. That's what made her such a tireless and effective champion for the people of upstate and western New York. Her absence will be felt not only by her staff and family and colleagues gathered here today, but also by her constituents and all of us in the New York delegation for whom Louise accomplished so much. Of course, Louise, the tireless fighter, was also beloved. She loved Rochester, and Rochester loved her. From one corner of Monroe County to the other, she was simply and belovedly known as Louise. When I first ran for the Senate, Louise volunteered to drive me around her Rochester district and introduce me to her constituents. We had worked together for many years in the House, but I had never traveled with her in her district since it was far from my own in Brooklyn and Queens. Now I expected the usual dog and pony show, stopping to shake some hands, cut some ribbons. Turns out, wherever we went, it was like a family reunion. Folks would joyously embrace Wheezy. Everyone I met seemed to have a story, more often several, about how Louise had made their lives better. I have one myself. At one of my first press conferences in Rochester, I occasionally do those, you know. <clears throat> I was doing an event, and as typical, I lost my reading glasses. My staff was in a tizzy, trying to stall the event until we could find them. I felt a tap on my shoulder. Here, Chuck, use mine. I did the whole press conference in Louise's signature red glasses. <laughs> it may have been a simple kindness, but knowing Louise, I suspected she was tired of waiting for me to get my act together. <laughs> and I always thought that Louise had to stay in office as long as she did to give the rest of us time to catch up with her. She treated everybody, Republican, Democrat, and everyone else like they were her kin, for better or for worse. 
That sometimes meant she told you that she thought you were wrong, usually exactly how and why in six different ways you were wrong. As Louise was fondly saying, they don't call me slaughter for nothing. I'm sure she's looking down on us right now. Probably a little mad I'm taking so long, wondering what the big fuss is about, why we're swapping stories about her when there's so much to be done. Because she knew, intimately, having grown up in the coal fields of Appalachia, just how high the stakes were. How just one burden lightened could change a life or transform a whole community. In her memory, let us all commit to the great work of public service with the same humanity, passion, and intensity that defined Louise's amazing career and her amazing life. How many people here were hearing Louise Slaughter sing Amazing Grace during that beautiful rendition that we heard? How many times she moved us to tears when she wasn't moving us to laughter with her beautiful personality? What an honor it is for our colleagues, Rosa, Doris, Gwen, and Paul and I to have this privilege, for us to have this privilege to speak uh, for other colleagues in the Congress. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for bringing us together this afternoon in such a beautiful way. Because you know, we all thought we were Louise's best friend. Every single one of us, right, my colleagues? So many who went to Rochester. It's beautiful to see Chuck Schumer come back over to the House uh, to sing the praises of Louise. And again, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one of the great privileges and joys and prides of my speakership was to name Louise Slaughter the first woman chair of the Rules Committee. <laughs> and I wasn't just proud of it because she was the first woman, but because of the excellence of her work. Now, Gwen said that her sister said, who's that old lady? That must have been your younger sister. Yes, it was. Okay. Well, my older brother, who was Louise's age, used to say to me, who's that girl on TV? <laughs> Doing such a good job on the rules committee. She's always working. Who's that girl? That girl is Louise Slaughter. And here we are, amazing grace, we so many friends here, really in the shadow of her fellow Kentuckian. Here he is right there, the first uh, Henry Clay, who was the Speaker of the House. And it says on there, leader and statesman. And when he passed away, there was a great deal of uh, remembrances of him, no more than of Louise Slaughter, leader and stateswoman from Kentucky, but New Yorker through and through. Right, Joe Crowley? So again, it's a blessing for us to be able to be here with Meg and Amy and Robin, as Louise would say, the best family ever, right? And her beautiful grandbaby, right, Dan? She would say, the most beautiful baby in the world. In case you didn't know, Louise was given two superlatives. <laughs> superlatives. And, there, and today, we had the privilege of planting a tree in her honor. Now, you have to know what an accomplishment that is. Because when they came to me and said, I want to plant a tree in Louise's honor, I said, well, on the first anniversary of her passing? Because that's how long it takes to get a tree. Well, not for Louise. Friday it was decided, but a tree was desired. Today, the tree was planted. A walnut tree, she loved walnuts. The speaker said they really make it hard to mow a lawn. And the tree will grow tall, very tall, and it will be uh, a, a, a something, a sight to behold, so beautiful. And then when it grows fuller, it will be a comfort in the shade. Uh, but it will be about renewal and growth 
and trees and others today spoke about how she, her first civic action was to protect a grove, try to tr protect a grove of trees uh, in her district. And here we are planting a tree for her today. It was wonderful to see so many members in a bipartisan delegation joined by German Sessions uh, to go to Rochester. It was a beautiful sight to behold so many members, but it was also wonderful to see members of her official family from Rochester and from Albany, right, Paul? Paul connects in every way. Uh, so here we are in this room with an outpouring of love again for someone we loved so dearly. Rosa talked about when she and Anna saw Louise for the last time. I remember that day too. I saw her earlier and she looked so beautiful. She was ready for Bob Slaughter. It was one word, Bob Slaughter. She was ready to go see Bob Slaughter. She was Louise, one name. He was two names in one, Bob Slaughter. But I'll never forget the first time I saw Louise. I met Louise. I was coming to Congress in the midterm. She was already serving. And I knew of her before because Mario, Governor Mario Cuomo had sung her praises to the sky. He said sort of an Italian phrase, uh, Rosa, you'll understand. He said, wait until you meet Louise. Maron. <laughs> She's so spectacular. So when I met her, I, I told her, I said, I knew of you before because of your reputation described to me in Italian uh, by Governor Cuomo. It was so lovely that Matilda Cuomo was at the service uh, in, in Rochester as well. Not, Rochester was not just her home and her district. It was sort of a state of mind, that district, Rochester and beyond. It was a hallowed ground for her in many ways, but also because she loved the people she represented, but also uh, because it was the birthplace of women's rights and progress. Louise felt a deep pride in representing the area around Seneca Falls and standing on the shoulders of the suffragettes. Uh, she took us there for the 150th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, she took us there back again a few years later uh, for our bus tour, Rosa organized, When Women Succeed, America Succeeds, bus tour. It was all women and Paul Tonko. <laughs> you know? He was our Frederick Douglass of the group. <laughs> but more importantly, Louise took seriously her responsibility to empower the next generation of women to stand on her shoulders. Throughout her time in Congress, she mentored staff and other women members to achieve their full potential. And in doing so, she changed the character and the culture of the Congress. Louise made the Congress more diverse, more welcoming to women, and more representative of our nation. She encouraged members and staff alike to know their power. And we thank her staff. She loved her staff. She took pride in her staff, and I know that they took pride, whether it was the Rules Committee or her personal staff. Uh, let's thank her staff. So there are two things I want to say in, in conclusion. One is that Louise was a moral force in the Congress. When you had to make a decision and you went to speak to Louise about it, it was about looking into a mirror of your own conscience. Her response was always so right, so values-based, that you wondered why it was ever a question to begin with. She was just always right there with all the brilliance, all the values, all the spirituality of making, making people recognize what they knew was right and giving people courage to do what was right. She was something. So it was like looking into your own soul and having to answer for it to have to go face Louise. And if you were on the wrong track, well, you wouldn't be there too long. <laughs> you wouldn't be there too long. 
She uh, admired that moral leadership. She firmly believed in the moral responsibility of the Congress to expand freedoms and advance better futures for the American people. So when, when um, she was as, as the chair of the committee, one of the first bills she sent to expand freedom uh, for women in the workplace by sending down right away the Lilly Ledbetter Act. Uh, she expanded uh, freedoms of respecting a woman's right to make her own personal decision. She expanded freedoms working with girlfriend Gwen Moore. She, uh, she a piece of work or what? Gwen Moore <laughs> on the Violence Against Women Act that Gwen was our, our champion on. She worked closely with Lee, Louise. Uh, it, her, she, all of these things that she did, it wasn't, though, confined to just issues that related to women's rights, although that was a priority for her. It also related uh, to one of her, and, and Rosa talked about her Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which was historic. Only a microbiologist would have come up with that, right? She, 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 just, she was so determination, determined, as I said at her other service, Save yourself time, do what she wants right from the start, because eventually you will end up doing it. But she took great pride in her uh, honoring the public trust with her Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge, or the Stock Act. This was maybe some considered outside her wheelhouse, but not. It was about integrity. It was about integrity. I'm hoping we can name that bill for her. <laughs> <laughs> Scripture tells us, as each one of us has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Louise used her gifts so beautifully in the service of so many as we mourn her passing, and we do mourn her passing to her family. I hope it is a comfort to you that so many people truly mourn your loss as our family loss as well and are praying for you for a long time to come. Uh, as we mourn her passing, let us move forward in her name. As, as uh, Leader Schumer said, and with her spirit, we work together uh, to have a better future for all. Louise truly blessed this country and this institution with her presence. God truly blessed America with her presence and her legacy. Thank you all. Well, I am um, I'm the Republican on the program, uh, finishing last, which is exactly how Louise Slaughter would have wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> there are. Uh, Superlatives is the way, the word I think of, what I think of Louise Slaughter. There are so many superlatives you can use to describe the kind of person Louise was. Um, first, let me just share with you uh, a sense of what it was like to be on the other side of the aisle, uh, because I think it speaks to Louise. I think it helps you see how effective this woman was. I think it speaks to how revered she was. Formidable doesn't even begin to describe it. <laughs> she was so resolute, so certain in her point of view, you could try to convince her otherwise. I tried it many times. Uh, I don't think I succeeded ever. <laughs> um, but if you did not have every fact straight, if you did not have your homework done, forget it, you didn't stand a chance. But what I enjoyed so much was Louise could be so warm. She could be warm and direct and warm and direct in such a fast space of time, your head would be spinning. And I mean this, you know, you could hardly keep up with her. She'd be up there in the rules committee battling it out till three and the four in the morning, and then you'd be walking through here in Shatory Hall, and at 8 a.m. she'd be giving constituents a tour, and then at 10.30 she'd be managing a rule on the floor. And all the while, she'd be throwing these one-liners at you as you passed her by in the hallway. <laughs> she was a one-liner machine. Um, <laughs> that bill that, um, that uh, Rosa spoke so affectionately of, Fast Track, uh, we like to call it Trade Promotion Authority. 
Um, that was my bill. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we would really, really enjoy these spirited debates up at the Rules Committee. Um, I spent years up there, hours up there. And for those of us who serve here and those of, us, those of you who watch C-SPAN, it can get pretty animated up there. I mean, those arguments can get pretty, pretty spicy. Uh, they can even get personal. But Louise Slaughter always came back the next day, the first person ready to turn the page, ready to move on, ready to start over. Uh, that's one of the most reasons, one of the most admirable qualities, I think. It's, it's why you could not help but like this woman. Uh, here's one more thing I really remember of her. Um, away from the dais, she was a very, very gracious, kind human being. Uh, she knew about people's lives. She always asked you about your family. She was really polite to staff. She treated everyone the same. And that really speaks to someone who's been given so much, who wields a gavel, who has a great amount of power. It's a great testament to the kind of warm, smart, gracious, sharp-tongued human being that she was. <laughs> uh, people like me on our side of the aisle will treasure those moments. I will treasure these fantastic debates that we had on behalf of our points of view, on behalf of this country up there in the Rules Committee and over there on the floor. Uh, you know, we talk a lot these days, uh, probably too much, about being on opposite sides. Uh, in between those aisles, there's a lot of scar tissue, a lot. Uh, but it is that space in between, that is where our humanity lies. And we all have to go on, the only thing we have to go on really is our respect for one another and our understanding of one another as people. Louise had that. She had this gift of respecting you, of caring about you, while still being so passionate in the pursuit of her principles. No one did more to deepen the meaning of these kinds of things than Louise McIntosh Slaughter. Absolute pioneer, a grandmother, a mom, a giant. We will miss her very much. And as a result, at this time, we have a presentation to make. I remember when Nancy called me, Nancy Pelosi called me, um, to tell me what had happened to Louise and how she landed in the hospital. And it was so clear to me what she meant to you just how you spoke in the tone of your voice when you had notified me about her condition. And what uh, Leader Pelosi and I did was we requested that an American flag be flown above the Capitol in honor of our dear friend and colleague the day she passed. And so on behalf of Leader Pelosi and myself, on behalf of the entire House of Representatives, the People's House, it is my privilege to present this flag to Louise's family. Thank you, and may God bless Louis Slaughter. Well, I am Robin Slaughter Minerva, and uh, my family and I live in Brighton in Louise's district, so we're her constituents as well as her family. In a moment of weakness, I volunteered to speak for the family <laughs> at this event and tried to go through several drafts of what to say. But then I was watching C-SPAN last night with Mr. Tonko leading the tributes to mom. And just listening to what everyone was saying 
you know, she was funny, <laughs> she was tenacious, <laughs> she was stubborn, and I thought you really know her already. You know, there's nothing else I can say. And I could really feel how you loved her. And I wanted to kind of convey from, on behalf of our family how much she loved all of you. And being in Congress, and this is her favorite building, I have to disagree with Senator Schumer. She would love all this fuss <laughs> being made about her. <laughs> and I used to watch a lot of um, MSNBC with Mom in her kitchen, and members would come on the screen, and she'd say, there's Doris, she's my best friend, or there's Tonko, he's my best friend. And, and she'd say, Trey Gowdy doesn't believe that Tim Scott is my best friend. <laughs> and I would kind of think, you have a lot of best friends. But she did, she really did. <laughs> she really... And she loved being a member of the House of Representatives. Power, you know, parties changed, majorities changed. People would say, do you still like it, Louise? And she'd smile and just say, it's the best job in the world. And we would go to Wegmans, and you couldn't go to Wegmans without 15 people coming up and saying how she had helped the family or had helped them solve some problem. And we all know that that is a lot of good casework, and that's a lot of good staff. And she loved her staff, and actually, especially since after my dad passed away, they really stepped up and went above and beyond what a normal staff would have to do, and we have to thank them. <laughs> and since mom died, somebody posted an article from The Hill from 2004. And I don't remember reading it before, but the uh, reporter traveled to Rochester and interviewed her at lunch and really captured the enthusiasm that mom had for the job. And this is 2004. The reporter said, have you thought about retirement? <laughs> 14 years ago, <laughs> they asked if she thought about retirement. <laughs> and mom quoted a story about um, Albin Barkley. Albin Barkley. <laughs> from Kentucky. <laughs> he was in the House, he was in the Senate, he was Truman's vice president. She told a story that he died on the uh, floor of the Senate after giving a speech. And I looked it up and that's not really true. <laughs> but she said, I always thought that was the most wonderful way to go. Of course, I would swoon away on the floor with the sweet strains of Swing Low, Sweet Chariot in the background. And she didn't get to die in the Capitol, which would have been her dream. <laughs> but we sang Swing Low, Sweet Chariot at her funeral. And at one point I turned to my sister and I said, she would have loved this. <laughs> and then 30 seconds later, my husband turned to me and he said, she would have loved this. <laughs> and I mean, she would have loved this. The, the tree, she loved that tree. And the fact that it happened in record time would, you know, would be the best. That would, you know, she would tell that story to someone, you know, <laughs> she's telling it now, probably. <laughs> it usually takes a year, and they got my tree in a month. But I just wanted to say how much she really loved, you know, this was it for her. She loved the family. We know she loved us. <laughs> but I mean, she, uh, she wouldn't have retired to spend more time with her family. <laughs> but, <laughs> now you can help Gwen find a husband. Now you're retired, though. So. <laughs> but I just really thank you so much. It meant the world to her to be here, to serve people and fight for the little guy, and to be reelected over and over. I mean, it was everything for her. So thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the benediction. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we close our time together, send your spirit of peace and consolation upon us who mourn the loss of the honorable former chair and ranking member of the Rules Committee, Louise Slaughter. She was a glowing example, an icon of what it means to be a woman for others. Her decades of service to her New York district and to our great nation will be long appreciated by those whose lives are forever blessed by her life's work and dedication. Lord, may your angels come to greet our beloved Louise, and may those who mourn her here be consoled with the knowledge that for those who love you, everything is turned to good. May her soul and the souls of all the faithful and the unfaithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Please remain at your seats until the official party and family have departed. <laughs>